Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks very much. So as you can see, this is a joint paper with Gene, and he will answer most of the questions. And yeah. I'll move straight forward to the paper. So I'll start with some background. I'll try to go quickly over the background so that we have enough time to talk about the paper. So the first observation is that intermediate inputs comprise the majority of all trade manufacturers, about two thirds. And that uh, among them, some inputs are purchased on anonymous markets, but many are transacted within global uh, supply chains. And the nature of these transactions is quite different than anonymous markets. Uh, these transactions have distinctive, distinctive features which were elaborated by uh, the most recent World Development Report, which was devoted to global uh, supply chain. And they have identified a set of characteristics of trade uh, in intermediates in these global supply chains. So first, they, are, uh, they were made possible by fragmentation. And this is an uh, old hat. It has been discussed in the literature for a long time. But they emphasize that these transactions impose significant search costs uh, of buyers or suppliers. They require matching of compatible partners uh, because the products are not generic. And they often involve relationship specificity. As a result, they are sometimes governed by incomplete contract, and uh, these parties engage in frequent uh, renegotiations. And despite these short-term contracts, uh, there are long-lasting relationships, so there is some stickiness in, in these uh, re relationships. Now, there is a very large literature on uh, global supply chains that cover a lot of ground, and in the slide, uh, we mention a few of them, like geography, productivity implications, and the like. But there is very little literature on the impact of trade policy on these global supply chains, and particularly how the, the trade policy leads to reorganization of these uh, supply chains. So in terms of background, uh, the difference between, say, tariffs on intermediate inputs and final goods uh, are very significant. So, for example, the MFN tariffs in the G20 countries were about three quarters higher than tariffs on final goods. And in the U.S., uh, tariffs on final goods were about four times as high as tariffs on intermediate input. And in the US, the weighted average of uh, the tariffs on intermediate goods were very low, a little bit uh, below uh, 1%. But these things have changed with the uh, tariffs imposed by President Trump. So by September 2018, uh, more than 80% of intermediate goods imported from China were covered by tariffs and only 29% uh, of consumer goods were covered. And we calculated the average applied tariffs on imports of consumer goods and intermediate inputs, and you can sort of see the escalation of tariffs in the last few years. So through this entire period until 2017, the average tariff on final goods was higher than on the inputs and was still below 1%. But then there was a rapid rise in tariffs on both final goods and intermediate inputs. And the rise in tariffs on intermediate inputs, the blue line, uh, was much steeper. And they are now uh, uh, significantly higher tariffs on uh, uh, final goods. So this is our uh, point of departure, and we are going to focus on tariffs on intermediate goods and uh, leave aside uh, tariffs on final goods. 
So there is a lot of anecdotal evidence in the business press about how these tariffs on intermediate goods affect behavior. I don't want to go through the detail, but essentially, the tariffs on China brought about a reallocation of sourcing from China to some other country like Vietnam, Taiwan, and many companies were involved in uh, this uh, change in sourcing pattern, some very big companies. And it turned out that uh, we don't have to rely only on uh, uh, anecdotal evidence, but we can do some calcul uh, some estimation and see that indeed this reshuffling uh, has been significant. Uh, so we did the just for illustrative purposes, a different and different regression along the lines of uh, Amiti Redding and Weinstein's work, where we use data on final goods uh, and intermediate inputs. And let me jump to the table. Uh, so, what you see in this table is how the difference between the tariffs on China and tariffs on 13 low-cost countries, which include uh, Vietnam, Malaysia, and countries of this sort, how this difference affected uh, imports from China and imports from these countries. And you can see the negative impact uh, on the imports from China and the positive impact on imports from the other 13 uh, low-cost countries. So the, this is uh, the motivation for the paper, which is a theoretical paper. And the goal of the paper is to develop a model of international trade in intermediate inputs that captures some of the salient features of the global supply chains that I uh, mentioned when I discussed the World Bank report. So the features that our model uh, captures uh, are A, the fragmentation of production, but this is trivial, it has to be part of it. What is novel and important in our framework is the role of search costs, where buyers of intermediate inputs have to sell buyers in different countries. And we allow for variable match productivity uh, when a, a, a buyer finds a supplier, they engage in negotiations. Uh, they, uh, they negotiate about price. And this generates a very short-lived contract that can be renegotiated if there is a shock to the system. And then finally, there are some sun costs involved. And what the, these sunk costs do is they generate stickiness in the relationship. So one doesn't rush to immediately replace suppliers if there is some small change in circumstances. But if the change is big enough, then there's going to be a, a change that I will discuss in detail. So oh, we started uh, this. Can, yeah? can I ask you a quick question? So, um, so is there some, I mean, I, I get the sense that you're thinking about the, sub, the substitution that happens at the intermediate input stage is different than at the final good stage. Um, and so I could think of that as being some sort of elasticity, you know, some measured elasticity of substitution. Um, is, is that sort of much lower in intermediate inputs than if I think of final goods um, or even like raw materials? No. It's not an elasticity of substitution, as you will see. It's a, it's a, structural, uh, subst it's a, a structural substitution. And I mean, you could think that uh, similar considerations apply to final goods. So uh, I, don't, I don't want to exclude it, but we focus on intermediate inputs. So it's, it's not that we, fo that we just assume some substitutability across inputs uh, 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 supplied by different countries and some elasticity of substitution. They can be perfect substitutes. But what we want to emphasize is the, the switching costs across suppliers. And this will be the sort of key mechanism that uh, will work in the model. Okay. So we start 
at the price and welfare effects of these tariff shocks. And the way we think about it is that it's an unanticipated shock. So as you will see, we'll start with an e economy that settles down in what you can consider to be a long run equilibrium, like a steady state. And then the system is shocked by an unanticipated tariff. And we ask the question, how does it adjust to this unanticipated shock? So the, there are two uh, essentially tariff levels uh, that are qualitatively different. One is what we call a small tariff. And so a small tariff is a tariff such that uh, it doesn't give advantage to some other country in the supply of intermediate inputs. But nevertheless, because uh, there is negotiation over price, even if companies that source these inputs do not switch search to other countries, the tariff can affect the price that they have to pay to the supplier. And then for large enough tariffs, and I'll talk in more detail about when they arise, what's happening is that at least some of the expensive suppliers in the original country of supply are replaced by suppliers from some other countries. And if the tariff is high enough, it makes it worthwhile for the buyer to invest in new search of suppliers in another country that, for example, is not subjected to the tariff. So it's important here that the tariff is discriminatory. And this other country may also be the home country. So this is not excluded. And in fact, in the paper, we discuss the, the, the different welfare effects when the buyer switches to suppliers in her own country versus in some other country that's not subjected to the, subjected to the higher tariff. But I will not say much about switching to home supply today because uh, the seminar is too short for all these details. Uh, and then uh, we keep away from some issues which were discussed in some earlier literature, such as these papers by Ornelis and uh, Turner and Antos and Steiger, uh, and their work has emphasized the holdup problem uh, in incomplete contract, uh, which we at this point uh, decided to exclude and focus on this. Uh, alternative mechanism that has to do with search. Okay, so um, a brief description of the model before I uh, start presenting the equations. So think about a country uh, that has two sectors. Uh, one sector is producing a homogeneous good with constant returns to scale, and this sector is using only labor. And then there is a second sector that produces differ a differentiated product. So there are many varieties of this differentiated product. And in this sector, there is monopolistic competition and a a a relational supply chains. And I'll explain more about the supply chains in a moment. So the technology for the differentiated products uh, uh, looks like this they combine labor and the composite intermediate good to produce each variety of the differentiated product. The composite good, uh, intermediate input requires a com continuum of inputs. And for convenience, we assume that they are required in fixed proportions. This sort of simplifies the, the calculations, although it's, uh, no, it's not sort of uh, essential. And then inputs are imported from, in principle, from one or more source, or they can be produced at home, and uh, also they can be produced in-house uh, if necessary. So uh, the search and bar bargaining is what, what's, so, what's important uh, in this framework. So the final producer 
has to search for a supplier of every one of the of this continuum of intermediate inputs and this search involves cost so the buyer has to design a search strategy uh, and i'll talk about it more in a moment so then why after the search is done the supplier is matched with a, su a supplier of each one of these inter of these intermediate uh, intermediate inputs and the match generates a productivity so the question how does she search and when does she stop searching is a, a question I'll answer soon then once she decides to match with the particular suppliers they negotiate a short-term contract uh, if the negotiations uh, fail she can always go and search again for another supplier or, or she can decide to produce the good in-house but in our formulation as you will see the option is uh, to search for another supplier is always better than pro to produce in-house and then we construct a long-run equilibrium of this economy where the entrance uh, to the differentiated product sector uh, zero profits in anticipation of free trade so we assume that everybody anticipates free trade and this is therefore the long-run equilibrium and this is going to be our point of departure for the trade policy analysis okay so this is the storyline uh, so now uh, more details so the utility function that we use is uh, a well-known uh, quasi-linear utility function where y is the homogeneous good and it has a constant marginal utility and U x is the aggregate of the differentiated product will we'll use a constant elasticity of demand for capital x so this elasticity will be epsilon and the elasticity of substitution across varieties is a sigma so all of this is standard and we are going to assume that uh, sigma is the larger than epsilon but importantly as you will see this elasticity of demand epsilon proves to be quite important. So for example, we could have reformulated this problem with many sectors, uh, X, say XI, and then uh, within every sector, you can have a different elasticity of demand and elasticity of substitution. And then you would see, following our analysis, that the way a tariff shocks this economy can be very different across sectors if they differ in the demand elasticity epsilon okay so we, we decided to work with one sector because uh, the whole analysis is within the sector but in principle you can have multiple sectors so then we have a price index capital p the sort of usual price in price index uh, that cs functions generate Uh, so now what about production so I, as i mentioned Elena? already the homogeneous good is Elena. produced with labor on, yeah Can yes. I so um so you didn't specify like time preferences over time um i i thought you were kind of going you started out by saying there's some substitution that might be different at different horizons i got the sense of that is that not something that you, you yeah. want to talk so, about so think about I, I can talk about it but it's not it's not important the, the way we think about it is that there's a constant discount rate and the discount rate uh, is equal to the interest rate uh, so we will have an interest rate but you know remember that here it's a quasi-linear uh, utility function so think about the discount rate as the interest rate and the interest rate uh, will play a role because uh, these firms will have some capital expenditures so they'll have to amortize, uh, amortize it 
Okay, but yeah, I didn't do it explicitly because we, we it's not an interesting part of what but we do. I guess it just goes like if, if you're going to think about the transition following a shock, um, yeah. Then we, we, that might be more of a macro factor where the interest rate moves around. There's some substitution, and, um, and so it yes. wasn't so in quite our clear. case, the yeah, the interest rate doesn't move. Yep. So, okay. So the, you'll you'll see. Okay, since you raised the issue, in our case, the adjustment will be instantaneous, and this okay. is because what we assume about the search technology. So you, you'll see it very clearly when I explain, okay? And uh, if I wanted to do a more complicated search technology, it will be more, uh, it will be better, but it turns out to be a, 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 something which is quite complicated. So it complicates things tremendously. So we, we are going to make a very strong assumption about search to get away from some of these complications, okay? So the production of uh, the, the varieties of the differentiated product uh, have a production function Z of L and M. So M is the bundle of intermediate inputs that they use and L is the amount of labor. This is constant returns to scale. For much of the analysis, we just assume that this is Cobb Douglas. And then the unit cost function is uh, phi, which is uh, the marginal cost to the power of alpha, where alpha is the uh, share of labor, essentially. Okay, so in principle, you can think uh, that there are many countries in the world from which a firm uh, in the home country can source. And uh, there is symmetry across firms and inputs. So all producers initially choose one country, say country A, from which they source uh, all these inputs because of the symmetry. And at the end, I'll say something about it. So there is some wage rate, WA, which for now we'll uh, denote by W also, so that we don't carry around A as long as we talk about a single uh, source of these inputs which is the country with the lowest uh, wage rate. And this uh, is the correct specification because we assume that the distribution of productivity of potential suppliers is the same in every country. If this weren't the case, uh, then one would have to use the search theory to determine which country is the source country of the inputs. Um, but with this simplification, it's very easy. It's the country with the lowest wage, as long as there are no tariffs involved. Okay, so here, here is uh, the search story. So there's some capital cost, capital F, that a firm has to bear uh, in order to uh, search for a supplier. And the search re uh, uh, recovers a supplier from some distribution G of a parameter A, which is the labor cost of the supplier to supply exactly the input that you need. So, the, and this is the same distribution uh, for every uh, one of these inputs in the continuum between zero and one. So if you spend F, you learn the inverse match productivity A, which is in the interval zero, one, and you can engage this uh, supplier to produce your input and the cost of the supplier will be WA, where W is the wage rate of the supplier. As I mentioned before, this is the WA, but we just drop A as long as we have one country that supplies the inputs. So if I engage with a supplier, 
uh, I negotiated with him a, con uh, a price. Uh, and if I don't want to engage with him, I can do another search where another capital cost, capital F, and find hopefully a supplier who is a match, which who matches with me more efficiently, and therefore the cost of production of this input uh, are lower. So here is, uh, George, the, the, strong, the assumption we made. So we assume that you can sample suppliers as many times as you want, and it doesn't take any time to do it. So it happens instantly, okay? Now, if we don't do this assumption, then we we'll run, we'll run into the problems that exist in the labor search literature of uh, uh, on-the-job search. And this complicates the, the problem significantly. So what this assumption does, it says, okay, initially you can sample as many times as you want, then you settle on a supplier and production begins and so on. So it's not time consuming to search. Elena, but as I understand it, it's still sequential within the instant. The as yeah. you don't choose the number you sample initially, you just start sampling. No, you, you do it sequentially, that's right. So it's like a McCall's problem, is it? Yeah, it's a, very, it's a very standard search problem. And it has a very simple solution. So we know that this type of search problems, their solution is to choose a cutoff uh, which we call A bar. Then if you find the supplier with A below the cutoff, you stop searching. And you negotiate uh, with him the, the contract. So the, yeah, so, so it's a very simple and standard uh, solution of the search problem. So because uh, they can do it in a sequence, so the capital cost of search, which is denoted here by capital S, and it's a function of this cutoff that you choose, it's an endogenous variable that will play an important role in the analysis. So because of the station, stationarity, you can easily calculate it. Uh, because if you search once, you bear a cost of F. And then with the probability G of A bar, you find somebody with A below the cutoff, and then you stop searching. So there are no additional search costs. But uh, with probability one minus G, you find somebody during the search who has a higher A, and then you continue to search. And the new search costs as much as the old one, in the, the capital expenditure because of the stationarity. So it's cost again S. So you can calculate that S is simply capital F over G. And here George comes in the interest rate so you can transform it into the flow cost. Uh, so instead of looking at the capital cost, think about uh, the flow cost. Uh, and the flow, so we denote by lowercase f, the flow cost of capital F, and then the flow cost of search is simply lowercase f over G of A bar. So this gives us the functional form uh, of the search cost. And we will often use the assumption that uh, the probability distribution is Pareto, and so, and because A is between zero and one, then the G is A to the power of theta, where uh, theta is the shape parameter uh, of this distribution. And again, this theta is going to play an important role in the analysis. Okay, so this distribution is important. Uh, the interest rate uh, is not so important uh, because all we care about is about F, if, and if there's going to be another capital expenditure of entry, so you also transform it into a flow cost uh, using the interest rate. Okay, so is this clear? So this is one of the fundamental specifications that we employ uh, in the analysis. So now what about bargaining? 
So if I sampled and found a match A, which is below the cutoff, then I negotiate the price, which is denoted here, by, denoted here by a row of A. And the negotiations uh, take place, these are Nash negotiations with weights beta for the final good producer and one minus beta for the supplier of the intermediate input. So again, this beta, this way, the, the way the distribution of bargaining power is going to play an important role in, in the analysis. And the assumption that we are using is the following. Recall that we have a continuum of the suppliers of these inputs and the bundle that you need is in fixed proportions. So if you want M units of input in the production of the final good, you need at least M units of each one of this continuum of intermediate inputs. So the way the bargaining works is that, and there's a continuum of this supplier. So when I negotiate with one particular supplier, I take as given the bargaining outcome with every other supplier. And I want this supplier to supply M units of the input. Because if, if she supplies less than M, it's no, it's no use to me. And I have no reason to order more than M. So I, I go to the negotiations requesting M units to be supplied and we negotiate uh, over the price. So what are the options in these negotiations? So for the supplier, it's simple. It's, it's just zero. If uh, I don't buy from, uh, from him, then uh, he has no business with me. But what is the buyer's negotiation? What are my, uh, my, my negotiation strategy? So think about the buyer. She goes to negotiate with this supplier. She has an outside option, which consists of two. She can produce the good in-house, which we assume is more expensive than what you get, can get through search. Because otherwise you wouldn't search in the first place. So the outside option is to, if the negotiation breaks down, to go and find another supplier. And because everything happens in an instant of time, there is no discounting of this. And therefore the outside option is simply the conditional mean of whatever row I may end up paying uh, if I look for another supplier. And it's a conditional mean because it depends on my uh, search strategy, namely on the cut of a bar that I choose. So mu of rho as a function of a bar is this conditional mean. And then I have to bear a flow cost of searching. So this mu gives me the cost per unit or the expected cost per unit. And then I have a fixed cost of searching, which is F over G. And this produces the outside option of the buyer in the negotiation. So you solve a standard bargaining problem and you can calculate then the total cost for the buyer of acquiring M units of the input. And this total cost consists of two parts. One part which depends on the volume M and one part which does not. So the part that does not, and the part that does not depend on the volume is related to the search cost. This is the second term in this cost function. The first part is the expected value of A when I conditional on A bar. And this determines the perceived marginal cost, as you can see in this specification. So there is an average cost and a marginal cost. And the average is higher than the marginal, like in many models uh, of this type. But the, the, fixed, the, the average is higher than the marginal because of the search cost. So you can see immediately that the buyer and supplier 
through the negotiations they share in these search costs. Okay. Okay, so the rest of the model will be straightforward. So we can calculate the quantity M that the buyer needs using Shepard's lemma, where lowercase x is the quantity of the final good that uh, she wants to produce. Then given M, you can calculate what's the search cutoff that minimizes the cost of getting uh, this quantity. So th this is uh, this uh, simple program. And then by substituting into the negotiated uh, price, the solution to the optimal search problem you get a price which is a weighted average of the cost of producing the input by the supplier and the cost of producing the input by the most expensive supplier that you might have encountered uh, under your search strategy. So this is basically the story about bargaining and the prices uh, that emerge. And then one gets some simple relationship between the optimal cutoff and the quantity. Uh, this equation uses the Pareto distribution. And what you see is uh, that if you want to use a larger quantity of intermediate inputs, then you use a more string stringent search. So you use a lower search cutoff so that you get on average better, better outcomes. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of suppliers, then we saw already the perceived marginal cost fee. Uh, so the pricing of the final good is the standard pricing, and then there is free entry. So the operating profits pi zero, which you calculate from everything that I told you so far, has to equal to the amortized entry cost Fe plus the search. And this is true for each one of these intermediate input. And because if we use the functional forms, we can solve the model essentially in closed form. Uh, so everything is, is neat and nice and very intuitive and so on. Okay, so this is the background. We, and he, here is where we start. So we start with this type of equilibrium where there was entry of firms that brought down to zero the profits. Yes. And uh, there is optimal search and uh, there is production and uh, there is bargaining, there is production and so on. So everything is clean and, and nice. So we start from here. It took me a long time to describe the model and now we come to the real analysis. So we start from this equilibrium and uh, we ask the question, how does an unexpected tariff shock this equilibrium? And the important thing to note is that we start from an equilibrium in which there are already firms in the industry. So when you shock it, the question is, what happens to the profits of these firms? So even if their profits decline, they don't necessarily leave the industry because they achieved zero profits, including the search costs, the entry costs, and these are already sunk at this point in time. So as long as the operating profits are positive, they stay in the industry. And then the question is, uh, my, can it happen that new firms will come in? So we'll talk about these things uh, in a moment. Okay, so let me start with the case of a small unanticipated tariff. So remember, a small tariff is a tariff that doesn't induce search in another country for suppliers. 
so I, I'm going to introduce back uh, the index of the country capital A, and we denote by tau uh, one pl plus the tariff rate. So it's an ad valorem tariff. And as I said, the tariff is not anticipated. So the number of firms in the industry at the point when the tariff is imposed is the number of entrants in the full equilibrium that uh, with, uh, I, uh, I described before. So the small tariff is given in the last line here. It's a tariff such that tau times WA is smaller than the minimum uh, wage in the other countries that are not subjected to the tariff. So the way we think about it is that the tariff is imposed on country A, but not on other countries. And as I said before, one of the other countries can be the home country. So you can, you can decide to reshore and search for a supplier in your own country. So there is some new price that's negotiated. This is raw to the power of tau. Uh, so in terms of notation, what we do is uh, m as a function of tau tells you how many units of the intermediate a firm wants to use in the tariff equilibrium. Helena, and when, yeah, I'm a little confused with the timing here. So you've already found your supplier. Yes. And this tariff hits you at a point where you have identified the local, the, all the suppliers that you work with, yes. Yeah, so you've done the search process already, not knowing yeah. about the tariff. That's now right. you found the, this, this, the low cost supplier, and suddenly you find that there, you have to pay this tariff. You, you found your supplier, but you hadn't negotiated the price. The tariff I comes. Negotiate, I negotiated the price, but this was before the tariff. There was no tariff. So we negotiated some price. But now there's a new price. But now there's going to be a new price. Yes, okay. exactly. So the, we have here the raw uh, superscript tau, which is the price that you'll pay in the tariff equilibrium. And it will not be the same as the one you paid uh, in the equilibrium without tariffs. So the tariff inclusive cost of, uh, of the intermediate is going to be tau times rho to tau times m. So and this is just uh, a count. So Ellen, just, just, just to be clear about the expectations, this is um, a permanent change in tariffs? Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So, so we go from a permanent expectation of zero tariffs to a permanent expectation of a tariff at some level. But we are going to That's discuss fine. alternative levels of the tariff. Okay. So then uh, there is a new outside option in the negotiation, John, which uh, influences uh, the outcome. And you end up with some new price, which is a function of A, the A of the supplier and the tariff level. Uh, and then now you have to design a new search strategy if you are going to search for a supplier. Now, what's important here is the following that even if I choose not to, to search for a new supplier, my outside option in the negotiation depends on this choice. Why? Because I can walk away from you and look for somebody else to supply the good. So the negotiations take place in the shadow of the possibility that I will look for another supplier. And then the question is, what is my incentive to look for another supplier? And if I look for another supplier, uh, what sort of optimal search strategy will I use? And this optimal search strategy is denoted here by a bar of tau. So this depends on, obviously, on the tariff. So we go through the whole calculation. Uh, and we show that the new price is also a weighted average, like the other one, except that now, instead of A bar, we have A bar tau. 
So this means that if under the tariff, I'm used to engage in search, which is more lax, namely a higher A bar, then I will end up paying a higher price for a given, uh, for a, an input bought from a given supplier with technology A. And if uh, I will choose more stringent search uh, strategies, namely A bar will be lower, then this will lower my price. But of course, A bar is endogenous and is determined with all the other endogenous variables uh, in general equilibrium. Okay, so the question is now the following. Suppose that we are, uh, we are shocked with this tariff. I have the option to retain all my suppliers that I already found, and then I don't pay any search cost. There's no additional cost that I have to bear to find suppliers, but we are going to renegotiate the price in view of the tariff. So the, re the renegotiations take place in the shadow of the tariff. So the question is, is it possible that there is some cutoff AC such that I choose to replace all the suppliers whose costs are high, namely higher than ACWA, and retain those who are efficient suppliers high, with low uh, input requirements. So this is the question basically that one has to answer. So the first thing to note is we show that such an A cut of AC has to be the minimum between the new optimal search cutoff A bar, which is a function of tau now, and the original one A bar. So this means that if I want to choose a more stringent search strategy now, then I'm going to replace a bunch of suppliers. But if, as a result of the tariff, I choose to use a more relaxed search strategy, namely A bar tau bigger than A bar, then I retain all the suppliers. I still might pay different prices, but I'm not going to replace anybody. So the question is, under what circumstances do I want to replace uh, some of the suppliers? And what we show is the following. Holding constant the number of firms in the industry, namely, this is the number of firms that entered in the original equilibrium, I use a more aggressive or more stringent search uh, strategy if and only if the elasticity of demand is smaller than one. So you remember I mentioned to you that this elasticity of demand is going to play a big role. On the other hand, if I had the elasticity of demand is bigger than one, then I use a more relaxed uh, search strategy. And the implication here is the following, that as long as the number of firms stays constant, then if the elasticity of demand is bigger than one, and I choose to use a more a relaxed uh, search strategy, I'm going to pay higher prices because this weakens me in the price negotiations with the suppliers whom I retain. I don't replace anybody. So my profits decline. And therefore, in the case in which the elasticity of demand is bigger than one, there are no new entrants and the firms who are in, they basically suffer some loss in operating profits, but as long as the operating profits are positive, they stay in the industry. On the other hand, if the elasticity of demand is smaller uh, than one, then what we show is that this, because this raises higher uh, prices raise the demand for the, uh, or expenditure on the differentiated product when the elasticity is smaller than one, 
then what happens is that this raises the profit. But if it raises the operating profit, then it makes it attractive to new firms to enter the industry. So the number of firms does not remain the same under these circumstances. So in one case, the number of firms remains the same and they suffer a loss in profits. In the other case, as uh, what we call inelastic demand, elasticity smaller than one, there is entry of new firms into the industry. And the entry proceeds so that until the optimal search strategy converges to the original search strategy. And then there is no replacement of any suppliers by the original producers. So to summarize this point, uh, I, I would say the following. No matter whether the elasticity of demand is bigger than one or smaller than one, there is no replacement of suppliers. But what's driving this result is different in the two cases of elastic and inelastic demand. In the elastic demand, it's because profits fall and these firms suffer losses. In the uh, inelastic case, profits go out and this attracts entrance and the entry of these firms basically reduce profits back and we end up with the same uh, search strategy and other things uh, remain the same and so on. Okay, so to summarize these points, we have here a proposition and which says what you see here, that in the elastic case, a small tariff generates no new searches and no entry or exit but negotiation with suppliers leads to higher input prices and consumer prices rise and the price index rises. It says under assumptions one to three, uh, the assumptions are Cobb Douglas, Pareto, and assumption three is assumption on parameters which ensures that the second order conditions are satisfied, which is essentially that theta, the shape parameter of the Pareto distribution, is larger than alpha, which is the share of labor in production, times sigma minus one. And then, if in the case of inelastic demand, a small tariff generates no new searches by the original producers, and no changes in the FOB price as they pay to their suppliers, there is entry, and the new producers adopt exactly the same search strategies as the original ones did. And again, consumer prices rise and the price index rises, despite the fact that there is more variety. So the price index rises because we have this tension on the one hand, there is entry, so there is more variety, it should reduce the price index. On the other hand, costs are higher and this raises the price index and the equilibrium is such that there's a, at the end of the day a hike in, in, in the price index. Okay, so now you, we can ask the question, you know, what, what are the welfare implications of all this? Uh, I don't know how do you want to conduct it. I was told to finish in an hour, but I, I don't see that I can finish in an hour. So shall I take another 15 minutes or what? And you can take a few extra minutes, sure. Okay. Okay, so let, let, let me just go uh, jump over these things and go to the... to the large tariff case, okay? Okay, so now let's think about large tariffs. So what does a large tariff mean here? Remember that the small tariff has a ceiling which makes the cost, uh, the labor cost in the two countries 
identical. So a large tariff is a tariff which makes the labor cost in or, the original country, country A, bigger. So this is the inequality. A large tariff is a tariff such that the wage in another country, which is not subjected to the tariff, yes, is smaller than tau times the wage in country A. And as I said, the country B can be the foreign country or it can be a foreign country or the domestic country. So now you have to go through uh, the equilibrium, uh, the calculation of uh, bargaining and so on. And the basic question now is the following. The question is whether a producer who sources source inputs in country A decides to replace some of his suppliers, some of her suppliers in A. If she does, then there exists some cut of AB such that she replaces all the suppliers in country A above this cut off with suppliers in, the, in country B, which is a higher wage country, but it's not subjected to the tariff. Okay? So the question is basically, uh, you know, whether this is possible. And I'll go st straight to the result. So think about an economy which satisfies these three assumptions that I mentioned before. And we look at a big tariff hike, one which makes it cheaper or makes the tariff adjusted wage in country A higher than the wage in country, uh, in country B. Then what's happening? In the inelastic case, if the elasticity is smaller than one, then producers retain their original suppliers in country A up to a point. So there is a cutoff, which is described here in this inequality, the first inequality on, on the right-hand side. So this is the cutoff such that below it, you retain the suppliers in country A. Above it, you drop them and you search for new suppliers in country B. Okay? And the number of firms is not as the original number, but the number that emerges when the tariff is just of the border between uh, what we call uh, large tariffs and small tariffs. What happens if the elasticity is bigger than one? Then with, without looking at the equation, what's happening is the following, that there is some extra room for retaining all the original suppliers. And this extra room is up to a tariff level which we identify as tau C, which we characterize precisely in, in the paper. So in this range, the behavior is like in the small tariff case because you don't essentially replace anybody. But once the tariff hits above this level, you replace some inefficient suppliers from country A and you find new ones in country B and this replacement is more pronounced the higher the tariff is. Okay, the number of active firms is the original numbers because remember in this case their profits fall so there is no uh, incentive to, to uh, for new firms to enter. So now look, this is sort of interesting because you can calculate the terms of trade for this case. And this is just uh, uh, one simulation. So this is a case where uh, the wage rate in country B is 20% higher than country A. And this uh, critical tariff tau C is delineated here by the second vertical uh, uh, line. So what you see is that small tariffs, small tariffs are tariffs up to 20% in this, uh, in this case, they bring about a deterioration of the terms of trade 
and the deterioration is bigger, the higher the tariff. But once you hit the boundary of the small tariff, what's happening is if this the tariff go beyond it, then the terms of trade improve. Why do they improve? Because once you start moving, so because once you hit this, the shadow of country B in your negotiations with suppliers in country A is such that you get a better deal. So you don't replace anybody but you have suddenly a better outside option in country B and you negotiate a better deal with your suppliers in country A. And this brings about an improvement in your terms of trade. But this doesn't last forever because once you hit this critical tariff level tau C, if you go beyond it, then you start moving uh, inputs away from A and into B. And this now entails a uh, search cost. So you have additional cost involved. So you still negotiate a better deal with your suppliers in A, but you have to bear these additional fixed costs of search. So for a while, you still improve your terms of trade, but eventually your terms of trade deteriorate. And uh, this is what you see in this rising uh, last part. So th this has implications, of course, for welfare. So this is what happens to welfare here. Welfare declines. And then in this narrow window, when you have the option of moving production to B, but you don't do it because uh, it's still optimal to stay with your old suppliers, but you negotiate better prices, welfare rises a little bit. And after that, it keeps falling. And it keeps falling because now you have new search costs that come with search in country B, and you suffer a deterioration in the terms of trade due to the standard Venerian uh, trade diversion. Because you move now to a country which is a higher wage country, and this is where you find your supplier, and this is where you buy your goods from. And you see, you can see that the welfare loss can be quite substantial uh, at these uh, uh, large tariffs. And for some, uh, and it, it's also, you have some concavity here. So uh, in this simulation, it's not so visible, but uh, it's basically there. Uh, and when you look at the inelastic case, uh, in the inelastic case, Initially, it's possible to gain a little bit, but eventually you lose in welfare terms. Now I mentioned, so on, I do one more point and then I summarize, okay? So the, I mentioned before and didn't do much with it because I didn't go through some results that the bargaining weight uh, plays an important role. And uh, it plays an important role because if you have a very high bargaining weight, namely if the buyer is powerful in the bargaining, then tariffs are very bad. But if the buyer doesn't have a lot of bargaining power, then tariffs can enhance the bargaining power of the buyer. And then a tariff can be uh, actually a good thing and Gene told me that if I show this uh, simulation, I will lose many friends because it suggests that tariffs can be welfare improving. So this is a simulation with much lower bargaining power of the uh, buyers and the low elasticity of substitution. And what you see is in this case, uh, tariffs can be beneficial, even high tariffs, However, the gains are very small, and we were not we, we were not able to produce very high uh, gains. But it's sort of curious, and the point is, <coughs> excuse me, and the, I think the important point that this emphasizes is 
the way trade policy works in this environment depends very much on the demand elasticity and the bargaining power of the uh, fine of the final good produced. So to summarize, we investigate a new mechanism uh, for tariffs to, uh, to affect prices uh, and welfare. And this uh, mechanism uh, emphasizes search and negotiations, and particularly it emphasizes renegotiations when tariffs are suddenly uh, imposed. And uh, the bargaining is important here. I didn't talk about the, the various welfare elements, but bargaining drives the wage between marginal cost of inputs uh, that the buyer perceives, the producer of the final good, and their true social cost. Uh, and this distorts the welfare calculus. Uh, so we have some discussion uh, of this. And uh, the important thing is what we know from the evidence and also intuitively we obviously understand it that if tariffs are very high and they are discriminatory, then they will cause trade diversion to higher cost countries. And this per se may be a bad thing. Uh, but in our case, the sort of novel twist of this is that this trade diversion hides also costs that have to do with the search that typically we don't pay attention to. But it plays an important role as we have seen in these uh, supply chains, uh, if indeed buyers have to identify suitable suppliers for their intermediate inputs. Now, what are the sort of elements uh, missing from the analysis? Uh, well, I'm sure everybody can make their own list, uh, but I'll point out just a few. So one uh, would think about heterogeneous suppliers with comparative advantage in different countries. And then you will not concentrate your search for suppliers in one country even in the original equilibrium. So th this, uh, in principle, can be introduced, but we haven't done it. Uh, there's the search issue that we already discussed uh, in view of George's qu uh, question. So uh, our search is timeless, and this simplifies the analysis tremendously. But obviously, it eliminates transition dynamics that uh, can be costly and uh, can generate possibly additional effects. Uh, so obviously we miss this. Uh, and there is this question that I mentioned before about holdup problems that people have looked. I think uh, that we can easily introduce it in some ways that will not change the analysis too much, uh, but uh, we haven't done it so far. We thought that it will be useful to have a sort of pure setup uh, which emphasizes a search uh, and bargaining. And that's the end of my story. Great. I'm gonna, I'll take over for Kim. I did such a good job last week. Um, thanks, Ellen. Um, we, we sort of open the floor to some more questions. So, so I'll, I'll follow up a little bit, which is um, there's several papers that, that kind of looked at this pricing um, following exchange rate shocks and search models. Um, it seems like a lot of what you're talking about would kind of operate the same way um, following any movement in the exchange rate. Is there any reason to think about it differently? Um, I think, uh, well, I, I mean, if we knew where exchange rates came the, the, from. The, the, the welfare analysis uh, might be different, but uh, it, it will be different also if, the, if, if, say, the dollar weakens relative to all the other currencies. But if it weakens only vis-a-vis -vis the Rambini, 
but not vis-a-vis -vis some other currency, then it will be similar. It will have similar elements. So it sort of depends, you know, what the exchange rate movement is about. And I think the, the welfare analysis will presumably be different, but uh, I cannot think through immediately what, what okay. it will be. Hello, it seems like um, it could give a nice explanation of kind of heterogeneity in the amount of a pass through of the tariff, you know, that you would might well see in the in the kind of microdata, sort of like the type of data used in the Goldberg and Tanderwall and Bagelbaum paper, where yeah. you you're you're kind of giving an explanation for a lot of different possible responses because of the rebargaining and so on. Yeah, yeah. So the pass through will be uh, different across uh, inputs because um, the movement in the search cutoff is common, and uh, and then if you look uh, how it's reflected in percentage changes in the prices that the buyers uh, pay, it will have different percentage changes depending on whether you look at a more efficient or a less efficient supplier. But we didn't think about it. So Gene will write it down and he will think about it after dinner today. <laughs> There's a Remnimby revaluation here could lower price, you could get negative pass through, right? It raises the bargaining power of the buyers. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it depends in what units we measure these things. Uh, well, one way to think, I mean, if you have so the if there is a devaluation of the dollar, then it, it becomes more expensive in dollar terms uh, to buy from China, then this is like the wage rate of China goes up in proportion. Yeah. So, uh, so the, the but yeah, so it looks similar, but uh, I think the other implications uh, should be really quite different. For example, you don't know, collect yeah. any tariff revenue when this did happens. Did you take it yes. what? Tariff revenue, what you did? I, yes, in the welfare analysis we did, absolutely, yeah. But if you so didn't the entry, what, couldn't a firm like the tariff, the importer? Cool, I didn't, he, I didn't hear you. Didn't, couldn't an importer like the tariff? Couldn't the importer like? Well, the importer likes the tariff only if the elasticity of demand is smaller than one. Yeah, but, but, yeah, and but, but then, but you know, he, he, he likes it only for an instant before the new firms mm -hmm. enter and they eliminate whatever gains the importer might have enjoyed. So uh, this is why, I mean, you know, if, if, it, if it was a proper dynamic analysis, then there would be some transition dynamics and some of these issues will, uh, will be better understood. But we really avoid it. You can see why we avoid it engaging in, in, the, in these uh, transition dynamics, because we have a lot of going on as is. So maybe, you know, maybe in the future, when we become sharper, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll do it. Okay. Anyone else? Okay. So, we'll uh, we'll call this the end of the the open recorded part, and then we'll just kind of go off record now. People can just hang out, and if they have more questions, they can. Um, get it off record. <laughs>